Ah, Valentine's Day. Romance is in the air. It's hard not to think about your love life when you're surrounded by images like this. In fact, some people get downright depressed at this time of year. And sooner or later, the lovelorn inevitably come up against the concept of... Sexual market value. A sexual market value. Sexual market value. Yes, let's take a subject that causes everyone stress at least once in their life and apply capitalism to it. That'll make everything better. Before we go on, we should note that one of the most effective advertising strategies is to play on your anxieties. Teeth not white enough? Try ripping off some tooth enamel. Stubborn belly fat? Here's this weight loss pill. Want to prove you're not a screw-up who can't get his life together? That new car should do the trick. Sexual market value plays perfectly into this strategy, and that's why incels can't stop talking about it. The gist of it goes like this. People can be ranked in terms of their desirability. Most folks who subscribe to this theory use the classic 1 to 10 scale. However, the problem, according to incels, is that women are always trying to date people above their station. The reason these incels aren't getting laid is because women with a sexual market value equal to theirs use makeup to go from a 3 out of 10 to a 7 out of 10. False advertising, in my opinion, and should be a punishable offense. To fuck men above their league. However, the things that make a woman attractive aren't the same as the things that make a man attractive. According to people who subscribe to the theory of sexual market value, a woman's desirability is determined by youth and beauty, whereas a man's desirability is determined by wealth and power. Now, we could talk about the entitlement in this ideology, about the way it objectifies women, about the way it disposes men towards toxic masculinity, and I've made those observations before, but today I'd like to ask a different question. Is it true? Is there any evidence to suggest that the dynamics of sexual attraction actually work this way? Let's start by looking at some of the underlying assumptions. The idea that people can be ranked on a scale of 1 to 10 implies that sex appeal follows a normal distribution. In other words, half the population is above a 5 and the other half is below, with the greatest concentration of people in the middle, in the 4 to 6 range. To be clear, sexual market value is a concept that applies only to heterosexual relationships. It says little about women's attraction to other women and men's attraction to other men, and even less about how non-binary and gender non-conforming people fit into all this. That fact alone should illustrate how unscientific it is, but let's press on. When I first began researching this topic, I found a study that said people on online dating sites tend to gravitate towards prospective partners who are roughly equal in terms of attractiveness. They called this phenomenon matching. However, the actual text of the study is behind a paywall, which means that there are several questions I can't answer. How are the researchers defining attractiveness? They mention not just physical beauty, but social desirability as well. Are there systemic antecedents to this behavior? In other words, do people look for equally attractive partners because the gaming strategy of online dating incentivizes them to do so? As I've illustrated in several talks, incentives have a powerful effect on human behavior. If matching is universal, does it play out differently in places with different beauty standards? For instance, in Uganda, plus-sized women are considered to be the most beautiful. But for men, it's very much the same as it is here in North America. Muscular and athletic is the gold standard. So if we were to run this experiment in Uganda, would we see muscular, athletic men matching with plus-sized women? Most people know that beauty standards vary quite a bit over time and across cultures. But were you aware that beauty standards can change in as little as 15 minutes? It turns out that the human brain is highly suggestible where this stuff is concerned. Forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, but Haiyang Yang of Johns Hopkins University and Leonard Lee of the National University of Singapore conducted a study in which they asked participants to rate profile pictures from online dating sites. Both men and women took part. 
Participants were sorted into three groups. Those who saw only their own rating for each picture, those who saw each picture's average score before giving their own rating, and those who saw each picture's average score after giving their own rating. Turns out that participants who were given no additional information expressed a wide range of tastes when it came to body type, skin tone, and facial structure. In fact, the more pictures they rated, the more diverse their individual preferences became. However, both groups that saw each picture's average score started conforming to the average opinion. In other words, if you saw that people with blonde hair were getting higher ratings, all of a sudden you started assigning higher scores to people with blonde hair and lower scores to people with dark hair. And it gets even better. A team of researchers visited several villages on Nicaragua's Mosquito Coast. Villages without access to television, the internet, or even electricity. The people living there had almost no exposure to Western media. 80 villagers, 40 men, and 40 women were recruited to be part of the study. They asked participants to describe the ideal woman by modifying computer-generated images. Pressing the arrow keys would make the body either thinner or fatter. After performing this task four times, villagers looked at pictures of either thin or plus-sized women. Fifteen minutes later, they repeated the task of describing the ideal woman by modifying computer-generated images. The result? Those villagers, both men and women, who saw pictures of thin women, showed a preference for thin bodies. And those villagers who saw pictures of plus-sized women showed a preference for curvy bodies. After only 15 minutes of exposure. So the bottom line here is this. Our standards of beauty are very arbitrary. We like what society tells us to like. And I know that somebody's going to chime in here with, But symmetrical faces are universally regarded as beautiful. However, in researching this video, I found several studies that called even that finding into question. So how does this apply to sexual market value? Remember, according to the theory, it's women who are ranked according to beauty. But if beauty standards are arbitrary, then the whole thing becomes a lot murkier. Take a guy who would never consider dating a fat woman, Show him some pictures of plus-sized models in sexy lingerie, and you might go from a 3 to an 8. So what about the men? According to the theory, we're judged based on power, prestige, and wealth. Confidence and good looks do factor in somewhat, but you can read five blog posts discussing a man's sexual market value and get ten different answers as to just how much good looks matter. So is this true? Is there any merit to it? Well, there is some research that indicates, at least in speed dating, men tend to select partners who are high on the physical attractiveness scale. And women look for a broader range of characteristics, which include, but are not limited to, high earning potential. But as we've already seen, standards of physical beauty are quite malleable. You should note that in this experiment, the traits that women used to evaluate their dates included things like parenting skills and overall health, so make of that what you will. Physical attractiveness was generally a good indicator of success for both men and women, but less tangible qualities like job title or education level had very little bearing on whether or not the dudes got a second date. I found several other studies that indicate that as countries come closer and closer to gender equality, men and women's dating preferences begin to align. In other words, the more independent women become, the less they care about a man's financial assets, and the less men care about youth and fertility. However, I'm flagging each of these studies with an asterisk because they both rely on self-report survey data and people aren't always honest about what they want in a partner. And this one researcher said that when you control for other variables, the evidence for beautiful women seeking out powerful men shrinks to almost nothing. But then her study is behind a paywall. So where does that leave us? Well, there does seem to be a grain of truth in some of the underlying assumptions behind sexual market value. 
Even among hunter-gatherer tribes, women do seem to prefer men who can provide for their families. However, it's not nearly as cut and dry as the manosphere makes it out to be. Standards of physical beauty change quite frequently. The ability to provide material resources is only one of many things that people look for in a partner. And yes, that also applies to the hunter-gatherers. Well, that's all well and good, but what you're probably wondering, dear viewer, is how this all relates to you. Let's take the incel hypothesis. According to them, sexual market value is an exact science that can be used to rank everyone. And what's more, those guys at the bottom of the ladder can't get dates because women are always trying to date men who are out of their league. This has been empirically disproved, by the way. The speed dating study shows that women very deliberately choose men whose overall desirability matches their own. And they rate their own desirability in terms of physical beauty. In other words, women are instinctively doing exactly what the incels wish they would do. We're living in an incel paradise. Yay? But for the sake of argument, let's assume the incel hypothesis is true. And what's more, let's assume a normal distribution of attractiveness for both genders because that's what the incels do whether they realize it or not. If that were the case, shouldn't there be a lot of supermodels who can't get a date? Who do these women go home with? Even if you assume that they compete with women on the next rung down, there would still be an enormous shortage of top-tier men. But Rich, this isn't helping. Please tell me that my deepest insecurities aren't actually true. I wish I had an easy answer for you. Remember that the right embraces a politics of fear. Making us feel insecure is a great way to keep the gears of capitalism turning. Anti-aging cream, weight loss pills, self-help books. These things all sell better when we feel dissatisfied with ourselves. And one way to keep us feeling dissatisfied is to make us strive for impossible standards. Molyneux, Rouche, and the rest of the red pill community? They talk about sexual market value because it's a great way to hook an audience of desperate young men. All of your deepest insecurities are true. But don't worry, I can make you an alpha male. As long as you buy my book. It really does come back to capitalism for these people. Hence their decision to describe romantic attraction with a term that is usually reserved for stock market portfolios. But to say it's all bullshit isn't entirely true either. Are there shallow people who value physical beauty over anything else? Yes. Are there opportunistic people who value wealth and power in a romantic partner? Yes. Can I guarantee that your crush will never fall into one of these two groups? No. But they aren't absolutes, either. There are entire communities dedicated to expressing love for people who defy conventional beauty standards. I mean, check out this guy. When uh, people see a guy with a plus-size woman, they just assume that, oh, it's just a fetish, or he's just curious to know what it's like to be with a larger girl. And um, also that when someone is with a bigger woman, they assume that he's kind of just you know, with her until something better comes along. I'm here to tell you that that's completely not true. You know, I can uh, tell you personally and speak on behalf of some really close friends of mine that there are men out there that genuinely appreciate you. You know, um, not only do we think that you're extremely sexy and we love your bodies completely, 100%, but also at the end of the day, your body should be the least of our worries anyway. Because when you're dating someone, it's, yeah, you know, it's good to be attracted to that person. But ultimately, you know, you have to ask yourself, do you guys share similar values? Does that person have their priorities together? And dudes, gender roles are changing. There are plenty of women who don't expect you to shoulder all the financial burden. And look, you're talking to a man who honestly believes that he will never find a long-term romantic partner. And who has made a kind of peace with that. Why? Because I choose art over money. Writing books doesn't pay a lot of money, and neither does my part-time job. 
I rely on my family for support. I've been quite clear about that. In that time, I've developed a new philosophy. It's pretty radical. Are you ready for it? I only apply for jobs I actually want to do. See, this is me, perpetually disorganized, a night owl, emotionally sensitive. I have been reprimanded for crying at work more than once. Socially awkward, prone to boredom. If you give me a repetitive task, which most jobs are, I have this tendency to zone out and start writing novels in my head. Non-conformist, hostile to authority, unable to multitask, that's part of the organization thing, and now on top of all that, I've got chronic pain. Uh, I could maybe overcome one or two of these things, but not all of them. I, I felt like I had to re overhaul my entire personality, essentially rebuild myself from the ground up. I felt like I had to make myself into a robot that, you know, the, whatever the corporations wanted me to be. And uh, I, I eventually said that I just couldn't do it. The amount of mental strain was just killing me. And the response you always get in a situation like that is just try harder. I did try harder. I like that. The part of the, the working for free was one of the many ways I tried harder. I tried harder so much that I had a nervous breakdown. The truth of the matter is that I am a shitty office worker. No, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I don't make a lot of money. I make some. I have a couple part-time jobs in addition to my novels. Maybe my novels will take off and I won't have to worry anymore. But my family does help me out. Without them, I would probably be homeless and quite possibly dead. I won't avail myself of social services because I refuse to be coerced into taking a job that I don't want. When I started publicly denouncing capitalism, giving talks and making videos, Various members of my family told me that my radical views would turn off potential employers. I smiled and said that I would take my chances. The secret I never told anyone is this. I was trying to turn off potential employers. You think I don't know what a hiring manager will think when he googles my name and sees these videos? That was my plan. To put my name on every blacklist so that even if I'm desperate, hungry, and homeless, I will never have to go back to an office job or to any other kind of menial work because it won't even be an option. I admit that at first I felt pretty guilty. Everyone else has to put up with miserable working conditions. Who was I to refuse? What makes me so special? I kept trying to articulate my reasons, but even with pages and pages of text, I just couldn't get it out. Then something made me ask myself, when is it okay to say no? Where is the reasonable limit at which an employee can look at his boss and say, no, what you're asking of me is unfair? And that's when I realized the problem. There isn't one. In our culture, employees and job seekers are supposed to say yes to everything. Turn over your Facebook password? Come into work even when you're deathly ill? Wear a device that shocks you if you move the wrong way. Take on three jobs because one isn't enough to make ends meet. And if we refuse, if we say it's too much to ask, they simply tell us that we're lazy and entitled. But in reality, they're working us to death. Any culture that embraces these values has tacitly agreed that workers aren't human beings. They're just tools to be used in the pursuit of profit and then discarded when they are no longer needed. As my mother once put it, and yes, she really did use these words, an employee is a cog in a machine. Well, I refuse to be a cog any longer. A month ago, I made this cute little video to apply for a job as a karaoke DJ. Now, if you need a boring paper resume, I can definitely get you one. But I thought I'd do it this way to... Okay, okay, that's enough. That's all of the video that we can play without getting the dreaded copyright claim. Hey, 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 don't even think about it, Mouse. Fair use. You can't sue me. Oh, well then I guess I won't have to unleash my army of lawyers. Oh, boy. Because I think that might actually be fun. No suits, minimal paperwork, no early mornings, or at least very few early mornings. 
and plenty of opportunities to entertain people with my silly voices and boisterous personality. The owner of the restaurant said that it was the best resume she had ever seen. Maybe I'll get the job. My royalties have been going up as my publisher expands into new markets. Maybe I can boost them even further. And maybe I can supplement my income with a Patreon campaign. I will look for ways to support myself on my own terms. But understand this. I would rather be dead than return to the cubicle farm. Or to any other environment that will use me up and spit me out as literally dozens of jobs have done to me. I will not take a job that makes me miserable. And I will not take a job that saps my energy to the point where I can't write. If that means I never achieve financial stability, so be it. And if that means that I die in five years, or two years, or tomorrow, so be it. I despise capitalism, the exploitation, the way workers are used up and cast aside. And we could make a million YouTube videos, but the only way we're going to change anything is by learning to say no. No, I won't stay late. No, I won't come in when I'm sick. No, I won't accept table scraps while you hoard the lion's share of the wealth. The system is designed to quell resistance by making survival contingent on obedience. Which means the only way to break their control is to be willing to forfeit your own survival. I would gladly give my life to end capitalism. But I've been on Bumble and I can tell you that most women would not be interested in a man with my views and my priorities. Which is fine, because the only reason I was on Bumble was a failed attempt to get over a woman who walked out of my life three years ago. Yep, there's a woman who has been living rent-free in my head since about 2015. But I am incapable of having feelings for more than one person at a time. Which means it's very unlikely that I will ever fall in love again. So yeah, Rich Penny, Perpetual Bachelor. Nice to meet you. Now why did I tell you this story? Well, I admit that it's been a secret for several years now. It was nice to finally get it off my chest. But really, I'm hoping that my story will help you. Look at me. By the standards of capitalism, I'm gutter trash. If there is a hierarchy of sexual market value, then my place on that hierarchy is way down here. I should be angry or miserable or full of self-hate. And I won't lie. Self-loathing is definitely something that I cope with. But I'm getting better. Because I'm starting to realize that the standards of capitalism are not the ones that I should be using to evaluate my self-worth. And to all of you out there, hear me when I say this. You are valuable. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter how well you conform to conventional beauty standards. It doesn't matter if you've had a hundred sexual partners or none at all. Every human being is intrinsically valuable, worthy of respect and consideration. And they remain so until they start refusing to see the value in others. The true measure of your character is not what you have, it's what you do. Now go support this channel by picking up some fantastic literature.